Hello there, I'm Catherine Nicholson and you are watching Talking Europe on France 24. Now today I'm pleased to be speaking to the most recent member to join the European Commission lineup. Mairead McGuinness was already a well-known face in Ireland before she was elected to represent Fine Gael at the European Parliament back in 2004 and later became the Parliament's first Vice President. Well, she was then appointed as European Commissioner for Ireland in October of this year to replace Phil Hogan, who resigned after breaking Irish COVID lockdown rules. Mairead McGuinness's portfolio covers financial services and stability, as well as the Capital Markets Union, meaning that she is now in charge, among other things, of how the City of London's financial institutions will access the European Union post-Brexit, one of the main topics of the week, of course. Mairead McGuinness, thank you very much for joining us. Delighted to be with you. Thank you. Now, I would like to start off with some just general questions about the ongoing Brexit situation uh, as a representative of the Commission, but also as the Commissioner for the Republic of Ireland, set to be strongly impacted by Brexit either way. Um, at the time of recording, no deal has yet been agreed on Brexit. Uh, do you believe that there realistically is time left or are we entering into a bit more of an in inevitable no deal and perhaps blame game between Brussels and London? Well, I hope that isn't the outcome because that wouldn't help either party here. Um, I think we have to be very calm in these moments because we are coming to, if you like, crunch time. And if you look at what has happened since the referendum in 2016, we have had to live with four years of uncertainty. Uh, we're at the end of this road now. The transition period ends at the end of this year. And the new relationship, either agreed or not agreed, will you know, take a kick in rather mm -hmm. from January the 1st. So as long as the parties remain talking to one another, and that is the case, I remain hopeful that an agreement will be reached, notwithstanding the fact that the issues that are unresolved have been unresolved for some time now. Mm -hmm. um, and I gather that while some progress has been made, that really on the substantive questions, governance, state aid, the fisheries issue, we haven't moved, if you like, uh, closer to one another. Um, and I think that there's a lot of, you know, uh, commentary and speculation and various parties saying various things. Uh, to my mind, from a European perspective, Michel Barnier has a mandate, a very clear mandate from the member states. He has continued to inform not just the member states, but also the European Parliament. And he's working very much to that mandate. He's also aware, as I am, as a former member of the European Parliament, that we will need, or rather the Parliament will need to ratify mm -hmm. a deal if there is one. Mm -hmm. So when you ask the question about time, I think it is a very, very good question because clearly we would be open to a deal. Let's say it runs into early next week, but that minimises the space for parliamentarians to mm. scrutinise the deal. I understand there is an openness in Parliament to, if you like, if need be, come back after Christmas between the new year and work uh, to that deadline. On the other hand, I think it would be better all round if we could reach an agreement sooner rather than later. And while many are perplexed at this very moment and there is anxiety on all sides and indeed all sectors of the European economy and I'd say in the UK there's also anxiety. I think always at the end game in a negotiation when things might appear to be going wrong that's the point at which things move forward. So maybe I'm a little bit more optimistic but I'm also cautious insofar as it doesn't take my eye off the other part of my work and the work of my colleagues here in the Commission which is to prepare our member states Mm -hmm. for change, because even with a deal, mm -hmm. there will be change. Mm -hmm. With a no deal, you know, the, the landscape looks much more difficult. Absolutely. Well, uh, recently, and for many months, in fact, France, the French government has been accused of playing the tough guy. Um, the French Europe minister, Clément Beaune, said on December 4th that France might use its, quote, veto if it wasn't happy uh, with a deal that's presented. Now, this very much goes against the last couple of years of member states, uh, as you've said, saying that they are negotiating as one via Michel Barnier. Uh, as a representative of the Commission, is that a worrying development for you? Again, um, I, I don't take too much concern because we've had such unity on Brexit for this length of time. And I believe that that unity persists and prevails. I think there are various member states who occasionally make comments because they have specific sectors and specific issues that they need to address. And very often, um, even in the member states uh, that I know best, you have to address that audience. So I, I don't particularly worry too much about individual comments from ministers across 
across member states because the mandate for Michel Barnier has not changed. I also know that there is a huge amount of text already agreed on the non-controversial issues. Well, mm. that's positive. What we need is more rapid progress on the last issues, which are problematic, but are important. And I suppose when I reflect on the last four years and the referendum, you know, the moment it happened, I don't think any of us thought that in four years we would still be discussing details of a future relationship. And don't forget the issue of the withdrawal agreement, which is already um, a, a, an agreed deal. Um, I understand that progress towards its full implementation is underway and nearing completion, which is possible. Positive, but there have been other troubling signs from the UK. So in these, as I say, moments mm -hmm. where we are close to the end game, we need to steady our nerves and think of the big picture. And I say this both as a European and indeed to colleagues in the UK, mm -hmm. because our citizens will not thank us if we fail to reach an agreement and if their lives are hugely disrupted. I'd like to just focus on financial services, which is obviously your commission portfolio. Uh, there's a question about whether uh, the City of London financial services firms could be, so to speak, locked out of European markets from the 1st of January. Uh, just to explain to our viewers, uh, this is because the EU hasn't yet granted uh, what's called regulatory equivalents, which would be the key to that access to the EU markets. Uh, Mairead McGuinness, is the EU, are you going to grant this equivalence uh, before the end of this year? Well, that's a very big question because there are so many different areas that we would need to discuss. So let me just, in general, the view here within the Commission, um, and it is the case that financial services are not part of the current discussions. So they are a separate, if you like, agenda point. It's also clear that London is a very big financial hub. And as part of the European Union, we were very happy to have London as a very strong financial centre within the EU. I think the long-term question is, what should the status be of of London now that it will be in a third country in relation to the European Union. What do we need to see? Are we OK with such a big financial centre mm -hmm. that we don't regulate, looking after lots of our services? On specific issues where it was in the interest of financial stability, we have acted. So on CCPs, on, on the clearinghouses, we have acted. We've given a time-limited um, equivalence. There are other areas that our colleagues in the UK have given equivalence in return on some other areas. Mm -hmm. We're looking at those, but we have made no decisions. We understand that there are some issues which will need to be addressed. We have not made any decision as to how they will be addressed, but we are conscious of the need for stability and certainty. And I was very clear at the very outset, indeed in my hearing before members of the European Parliament, that the EU will act in our best interests and therefore we take on board comments that are coming to us and concerns that are raised with us. But we are also working hand in glove with our colleagues on the task force, those who are negotiating the future relationship. And I suppose in summary, if a deal is agreed, you know, whenever that mm -hmm. happens, I think that makes life easier for all other sectors. Um, if a deal is not reached, then I suppose the relationships will be a little bit more difficult. Um, I think the issue of trust is really important in negotiations. And as you know, that has been breached somewhat because of the internal market bill in the United Kingdom. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that when and if the deal can be reached, we will deal with all of those other issues from the financial sector. There will be some short-term issues to be dealt with, but I think we will also begin to debate the bigger question that I raised about the role of a large financial hub servicing the European mm. Union from a third country. Uh, and those are issues and questions that we are already discussing. Well, another issue that's running out of time, getting all 27 EU member states to agree to the next seven-year EU budget, known as the MFF. Uh, this package worth 1.8 trillion euros, currently stuck, as you know, because Hungary and Poland vetoed it, the, the governments of those countries. They're objecting to a new mechanism that would block transfers of some EU funding to any member state that would be found to have broken rule of law commitments. So uh, this is an, a vast amount of money. Uh, member states, as we know, in need of their money uh, at this point, relying on it mm -hmm. uh, very much. Is it an option to drop this rule of law conditionality? 
Well, be very clear that we need certainty for citizens and certainly we need to agree the MFF and to make sure it's in place in the time that we need it to be in place. However, uh, the rule of law mechanism applies to all member states, not specific to one, two or three. It's for all member states to comply. And the third issue, and I think really important, the European Parliament is very strong on this issue of compliance with the rule of law. Mm. So clearly we would rather that the member states who have uh, issues at the moment would look again and rethink. But also we have to look at other options. And there is a mechanism that allows for some, if you like, movement of funds to happen, even if the overall is not agreed by all member states. It would be a restricted budget. Um, it would not do what we wanted to do in the big frame. But at least we are not blocked completely from moving forward. Mm -hmm. And again, in the time that's available, I would hope that, um, you know, reason would prevail and that we would respect the idea that there should be a link for all member states between finance and rule of law and not, if you like, separate the issue mm -hmm. of compliance to any one member state. I think that is not the objective. And from my contacts with members in the European Parliament, they are not mindful to be flexible on this. They are mm -hmm. holding very strongly mm -hmm. to this view. Just speaking about one of the countries I mentioned there, Hungary, it's Prime Minister Viktor Orban and his Fidesz party are members of the European People's Party grouping, of which you have long been a leading member since your time as an MEP. Now, in the past, you have spoken out in favour of Fidesz being expelled from this European People's Party uh, due to uh, various issues regarding rule of law and others. Do you maintain that position that Fidesz should be expelled? As a member of the Irish delegation, you very rightly say that we as a delegation raised this issue of the membership of the EPP. And I think there comes a point in time where these issues uh, will and have to be dealt with. Uh, in my current role here in the Commission, I clearly am not involved in the discussions around the EPP group in the European Parliament. Uh, but I understand the position of my colleagues, my former colleagues uh, from Ireland, holds good. They still believe that that is the case. All right, Mairead McGuinness, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Good to talk. And thanks to you as well. Hope to see you in part two of Talking Europe, where we will be debating the ongoing Brexit situation.